Chapter 2 Cyclone Pakistan Archer Blood, the ranking diplomat of the United States in East Pakistan, was a patriot and a career man. From the first time he realized there was such a thing as the Foreign Service, he was keenly interested in it. Remembers his widow, Margaret Millwood Blood. He had always looked at the world, and thought that everything had meaning. A sincere and rather bookish man from Virginia, Blood was tall and solidly handsome, with kindly eyes and an athlete's frame, wearing his dark hair slicked back. Although courteous and well-mannered, he confessed to having a turbulent private side, alternating between my personal scylla of bright expectation and charybdis of black despair. He kept that to himself. His wife, a vivacious and gracious graphic artist from New York, who is vibrant at 87 years old, recalls, he was an exact person. He could become interested in anything, but he wanted to know the exact facts. He seemed never to sit down without having a book in hand. She was struck by how disciplined he was when reading. Once, on their honeymoon in Greece, she misquoted a line from a magazine, and he calmly supplied the exact wording, asking her to be careful about such things. Blood was no rebel. Amid the hippies and burnouts of the 1960s and early 1970s, he was unreservedly square. In the Vietnam era, a group of American officials formed an organization called Foreign Service Officers Against the War, wearing protest badges, sometimes inside their jackets. Not blood. His most radical affectation was, in the torrid tropical heat of Dhaka, today known as Dhaka, to sometimes shed his dark business suit for a short-sleeved white shirt. In World War II, he served as a supply officer in the U.S. Navy, posted to frigid Alaska to ward off a Japanese onslaught that never came. With the unassuming dedication of the World War II generation, he chose public service. He was of course a patriot. Says his wife, who goes by Meg Blood. In those days everyone was geared to the war. The whole world was very, very patriotic, and very anxious to serve. Blood joined the Foreign Service in 1947, part of an entering class made up entirely of white men. He clambered his way up, working relentlessly hard, taking extra duty. His first posting was in Thessaloniki, Greece, during the Civil War. He married Meg there. The young couple's next stop was Munich, in 1949, still shattered in the immediate aftermath of World War II, his wife remembers seeing whole cities spilled into the street in brick form. Working in a displaced persons camp, Archer Blood took satisfaction in issuing huge numbers of U.S. visas to Hungarians, ethnic Germans from Eastern Europe, many Poles, and even more Jews. He served briefly in Algiers and Bonn, and put in some desk time in Washington, but his career was in the doldrums, and he wanted more challenging political work. In West Germany, a fellow diplomat, asked what his ultimate wish was, replied that he only wanted to be a consul general. Blood was baffled. I can't imagine not wanting to be an ambassador. He told his wife. It's the top. He grimly rode out the McCarthy era from Bonn, watching with contempt as McCarthy's hatchet men investigated the Foreign Service, driving many good officials out and cowing others into quietude. Blood was not inclined to resign in showy protest, but he rankled at the witch hunts. He believed in independent judgment in the Foreign Service. He remembered that anyone who had served in China was automatically under suspicion, and that careers were ended with accusations of homosexuality. It was, he later growled, just so obnoxious. China, soon after its communist revolution, was still a taboo subject at the State Department. One young diplomat in Bonn had worked in China, and blood was questioned about him. The security officials asked if this young China hand read the New York Times. The New York Times was considered by the security people as a leftist newspaper. And I was young enough to say, yes, I hope to hell he does. Two weeks after joining the Foreign Service, Blood had watched as the flags of newborn India and Pakistan were hoisted above their Washington embassies. Steeped in British stories of the Raj, he had always been fascinated with South Asia. In 1960, he was offered a choice of postings in Madras, in India, or Dhaka, in East Pakistan. He chose Dhaka out of ambition, he would have more freedom there, far removed from the oversight of the U.S. Embassy, and there would be more political turmoil for him to cover. Blood arrived on the subcontinent in June 1960, as a political officer and deputy principal officer at the Dhaka consulate that he would later run. His wife's first impression, as the plane neared Dhaka, was that the new home would be underwater. It was an ocean. Meg Blood says. They did not know if there would be enough land to put down an airplane. Green and flowering. She remembers. 
but definitely a land of water. For Archer Blood, as he wrote later, there was a magical quality to this ubiquitous water, which heightened the green of the rice paddies and the purple of the water hyacinths and furnished a shimmering mirror for the famed golden sun of Bengal. The first exposure was a shock. Driving in from the airport, with the car windows down in the swampy heat, Meg Blood was horrified to find herself face to face with a woman beggar with no nose. Their driver explained that the woman had probably been accused of adultery, and her husband had had her nose cut off. The car was surrounded by beggars. They saw disfigured children asking for coins. The water pump at their house turned out to be a 12-year-old boy. There had been a young American diplomat who arrived in Dhaka, took one look around, and announced his resignation. But the Blood family, with three children in tow, settled in and learned to love their hardship post. Our lives were delightful. Says Meg Blood. The social scene was relaxed, and they made fast friends both among Bengalis and West Pakistanis. We spent our evenings discussing tigers. Remembers Meg Blood merrily. The tales grew tall. There were a great many tigers, and they were causing trouble. They lost about 10 people a month to the tigers. Unafraid of tigers was an inquisitive little boy who lived one door down from the Bloods. Shahid al Haq, 11 years old, soon befriended the three American children. He taught them cricket, they wowed him with cokes and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. While most of the foreigners and diplomats living in their peaceful tree-lined neighborhood kept to themselves, the Bloods welcomed the Bengali child into their home for homework sessions and slumber parties, chatting with him, as curious about his life as he was about theirs. Hack fondly remembers how good these friendly Americans were at intermingling. Archer Blood was soothed by the pounding tropical rain on his roof. He loved to trek around the most remote hinterlands, eating humble chicken curry, finding serenity in long trips by rickety train or river steamer. He liked to be out on a tumble-down steamer, meandering down a tributary of the Ganges, watching hundreds of multicolored country boats speckling a river so vast that he could not see either bank. I was never really in a hurry to get anywhere. He later recalled. Not so at work. Eager for promotion, he threw himself into his duties. Although many Bengalis complained that the Americans were helping West Pakistan exploit East Pakistan, he took pride in the American economic development efforts, like the opening of the renowned Pakistan C2 Cholera Laboratory, mostly funded and staffed by Americans. When the first young Peace Corps volunteers arrived, he was heartened by their brash vitality. And he enjoyed easy relationships with Bengalis and West Pakistanis alike, once being whirled around at a boisterous dance party by General Muhammad Ayub Khan, then the military dictator of Pakistan. Blood's work as a political officer was, he later remembered, largely about relaying the grievances of Bengalis who felt abused by West Pakistan. This annoyed Washington because Washington liked to believe that Pakistan was a stable, united country. He said later, still, he thoroughly enjoyed the tour of duty. He remembered. The atmosphere, despite the grumblings of the Bengalis, was one of progress and hope. He left in June 1962, hoping one day to return. Blood got his chance sooner than he expected, when he was promoted into the senior echelons of the Foreign Service. He relished his first major posting as a deputy chief of mission in Afghanistan, where he loved roaming around places like Mazar-e-Sharif and Kunduz, and was surprised to find that the U.S. Embassy staff was on friendly terms with the Soviets. He hoped to do the same job in Ethiopia, but was instead shunted back to Greece. Here, for the first time, he found a posting that he hated. Greece was languishing under a military junta supported by the CIA. Blood, along with most of the political wing of the embassy in Athens, found it painful to watch the generals stifle the Greek people. Keen for elections, he worried that the Greek public would enduringly resent U.S. support of the junta. But the U.S. embassy was bitterly split. The rival American camps, for and against the military rulers, were openly hostile. He had never been at an embassy where he could not speak bluntly about the local government. He recalled later that, if you said anything mistaken as critical about members of the junta, the CIA would explode in anger. Blood's rivals tried to brand him as a troublemaker. When a new ambassador arrived, who argued that providing U.S. weaponry to the Greek junta would somehow return Greece to democracy, Blood hit the roof. These people will never bring back Greece to democracy. And this is a lie. The State Department, knowing how despondent blood was in toxic Athens, came to him with welcome news, there was an opening in Dhaka. He grabbed it immediately, bolting Athens in March 1970.
Back in Washington, with a little pomp, he placed his hand on a Bible and was sworn in as the Consul General of the United States in Dhaka. He eagerly flew off to command his first post. The U.S. consulate in Dhaka was a youthful, boisterous place. Despite the dingy, mildewed offices in their Adam G. Court building, the place hummed with energy. Blood, who was 48 at the time, the same age as Henry Kissinger, ranked as the eldest statesman of the outpost, but most of his staff was much younger. Their work was exhilarating. Long before Bangladesh was written off by Kissinger and others as a basket case. It was known as a terrific place for development work. Some of the best poverty-fighting economists and experts flocked there for cutting-edge work on how to boost crop yields and resist cholera. In the city of Camilla, they worked with actor Hamid Khan, whose path-breaking work on agricultural cooperatives and microfinance would help pave the way for the Bangladeshi economist Muhammad Yunus and Grameen Bank, winners of the Nobel Peace Prize in 2006 for their own microcredit efforts. Blood's officials were proud of their professionalism and commitment. Dhaka was not everyone's idea of a plum posting, but for scrappy, ambitious juveniles, it was a rush. This was not your tea and crumpets European assignment. Remembers Scott Butcher, Blood's junior political officer. This was a difficult part of the developing world. After a relatively quiet stint in Burma, he had gotten word of his posting on April Fool's Day and at first thought it was a joke. If you're a political officer, you're something of an ambulance chaser in terms of crisis reporting. He says. I got that in spades. While he was on home leave before shipping out for East Pakistan, his predecessor in Dhaka, a grizzled former U.S. Army officer, told him to brace himself. When Butcher asked him to sum up the place in a few words, he replied, Pestilential hole. There was considerable ridicule about all the sanguinary names at the post, heightened by a deputy political officer with the unfortunate name of Andrew Kilgore. Archer blood, of all the names. Says Samuel Hoskinson with a laugh. Scott Butcher remembers dryly that cables would be drafted by Butcher, approved by Kilgore, and signed by Blood. The anti-Americans thought, things bode ill. Eric Griffel, the chief of the U.S. Agency for International Development Team in Dhaka, was happy there too. I had begun to like Dhaka, strangely enough. He recalls. He came from a Polish-Jewish family, his parents had fled from Krakow to London just before World War II, and then he had moved to the United States at age 17 to go to UCLA. Griffel is round-faced and cherubic, belying his brisk, efficient manner. He speaks with a slight Polish accent, in clipped, blunt sentences. He was a rebellious and unflappable man. The more buttoned-down blood found him a little abrasive, but also a pillar of strength. Griffel had always been curious about the subcontinent, and East Pakistan was a place with terrible poverty, and he felt needed there. Blood's youthful staff liked the boss. He was dynamic and relatively young. He and his wife were a very dashing couple, with bright prospects. Recalls Butcher, who greatly respected Blood. He was clearly someone who was going on to much higher positions in the State Department. Griffel remembers. One would have thought he was completely conventional. Griffel is nobody's idea of conventional. He was a very nice, easygoing, conventional foreign service officer. Abel, did his job well, hard working. He was always there. There was no golf playing, this sort of thing. He says. He was patriotic, very much so, but he didn't wear it ostentatiously. He sums the man up. A very plain, good American civil servant. Dhaka was a great place for adventuring American reporters too. Sidney Shanberg, the New York Times reporter covering the Indian subcontinent, had wound up there by accident. With piercing eyes and a tidy beard, he is intense and indignant, fiercely moralistic, holding a deep affection for the peoples he has covered in his long career as a reporter. After graduating from Harvard and spending two years in the U.S. Army, he started out as a copy boy at the New York Times, and wound up staying for 26 years. As a cub reporter, his fondest hope was to go to Africa, where he could roam and report widely. Instead, the Times foreign desk offered him the exact opposite, Poland, in the Soviet deep freeze. But by a stroke of luck, the job of Delhi bureau chief came vacant, and Schanberg, in his late thirties, grabbed the chance. He is famous for covering the murderous fall of Cambodia to the Khmer Rouge in 1975, a nightmarish experience that was turned into a movie, The Killing Fields, but by then he would have already seen plenty of that kind of horror in East Pakistan. Democracy in Pakistan. Pakistan was in those days a country divided. 
The British, leaving India, had decided to create a single Muslim state in the subcontinent. To do so, they had to lump together Punjabis, Pashtuns, Baluchis, and Sindhis in the northwest with Bengalis far away in the east. Out of the bloody chaos of partition, Pakistan was born as a cartographic oddity, a unitary state whose two territories did not connect. West Pakistan was separated from East Pakistan by a thousand miles of India, a gigantic enemy with bitter memories of the displacement of millions of people in partition in 1947, not long earlier. A senior Indian diplomat execrated the British for leaving behind this geographical monstrosity. People joked that only three things kept Pakistan united, Islam, the English language, and Pakistan International Airlines, and Pia was the strongest. Scott Butcher, new to the region, was surprised by the strangeness of this bifurcated nation. His first stop was in West Pakistan, to check in with the embassy in Islamabad and the consulates in Karachi and Lahore. It was hot beyond belief, like stepping into a furnace. It was 111 degrees in Lahore, he remembers, and they said it was a cool spell. Everything seemed to him brown, sandy, parched, and dry. Then he flew on to Dhaka, the capital of East Pakistan, terrain roughly the size of Florida. It was completely different. It was so emerald green it almost hurt your eyes. He says. It was also unbearably hot, in the heat of June 1969, but swampy and moistly tropical. Another official in the Dhaka consulate remembers. Wonderful rice paddy fields, rivers with fantastic dows with tattered sails. Everything was so flat you could see what looked like boats sailing through rice paddy fields. They were actually miles away. The differences were more than geographic. The central government, the main military institutions, and the established bureaucracy were based in West Pakistan, far from the concerns of the Bengalis. West Pakistanis spoke many languages, the commonest being Urdu, while in East Pakistan almost everyone spoke Bengali. The whole country was dominated by Punjabi elites in West Pakistan, to the resentment of Bengalis in East Pakistan. The Bengalis were mostly Muslim, but in an officially Islamic nation, there was some suspicion of the sizable Bengali Hindu minority. While West Pakistan nursed grudges against India, the Bengalis in East Pakistan took little interest in that feud. Many Bengalis had started off as loyal Pakistani citizens, but they came to think that they were worse off economically than their fellow citizens in West Pakistan, and found their own ethnic traditions unwelcome. West Pakistan's military elite scorned the bingos as weak and unmartial. Bengali nationalists grumbled that they had replaced British colonialism with West Pakistani colonialism. It would have been hard to make a united Pakistan function even if it had the best government in the world. It did not. The country had to withstand civilian leaders who high-handedly tried to mandate Urdu as the national language, infuriating Bengalis, and then, even worse, was the imposition of martial law in 1958. Since the British had tended to favor Punjabis as their chosen warriors, there were few Bengalis in Pakistan's military. The generals stifled the country, banning political parties and making it impossible for Bengalis to voice their grievances as they had loudly done before. Democracy was always going to be a terrible challenge for a country that was literally split in two. There were plenty of enthusiasts for democracy in both wings of the country, but they faced tough basic demographic facts. East Pakistan, with about 75 million people, was more populous than West Pakistan, which had a population of some 61 million. The East demanded its proper democratic representation, the West feared losing its grip, and so constitutional negotiations deadlocked. When Bengalis called for ending martial law and holding elections, they also hoped to turn their numbers into political clout. By the time Yahya seized power in March 1969, East Pakistan was in almost constant turmoil, with Bengali street protesters facing off against the army. When Archer Blood returned to Dhaka, he found a much darker mood among his old Bengali acquaintances, including Shahidul Haq, now a restless young nationalist. The old economic resentments had simmered for too long, and after a ruinous war with India in 1965, many Bengalis were sour about being asked to take risks for the remote cause of Kashmir. Yahya was not just Pakistan's president, but also its foreign minister, defense minister, and chief martial law administrator. Still, he was far from the most anti-democratic general to rule Pakistan. Soon after taking office, he began working to end martial law and yield power to a new elected government, and then announced historic new elections. Blood and many of his staffers were impressed, but this democratic turn elicited no particular enthusiasm from Yahya's friend in the White House. I hope you keep a strong presidency as in France.
Richard Nixon told him, Yahya agreed. Without it Pakistan would disintegrate. The elections across the country were, after a postponement, finally set for December 7, 1970. Throughout Pakistan, a remarkably boisterous campaign went into full swing. As the balloting approached, Yahya was relaxed and expansive. I think they miscalculated the way it would go. Says Samuel Hoskinson, the White House aide, that West Pakistani elite were quite capable of deluding themselves as well. They weren't close enough to it. Or they had faulty information from their own people, sugarcoating bad news for the bosses. I don't think they had a good appreciation of that situation. Then a cataclysm struck. On November 13, not long after Yahya's visit to Washington to win U.S. arms, a massive cyclone devastated East Pakistan. The gale shrieked to 150 miles an hour, followed by a monstrous tidal wave over 20 feet high. There are still thousands of bodies of cattle and hundreds of bodies of people strewn on beaches and countryside. Blood's consulate reported over a week later, with an official in a low-flying helicopter staring in horror at the devastation below. Dead and alive cattle and dead and alive humans all mixed in one area. Scott Butcher heard stories of bodies thrown 30 feet into the trees, and of corpses found 60 miles out at sea. By the estimation of U.S. humanitarian agencies, at least 230,000 people died, fully 15% of the population of the areas hit by the storm. The State Department put the death toll even higher, at half a million, many of them drowned. One U.S. colonel with four years of battle experience in Vietnam said that it was worse than anything he had seen there. There was nothing to see after that water went through. Recalls Meg Blood, who went out to deliver emergency supplies. People were up in trees holding their children, and the trees were swept clean away. There was nothing to see. The homes were mostly thatch, on the water, and they were the first to go, to be swept away. Approaching the stricken zone in a helicopter, she had the image of a huge chocolate pudding dotted with raisins. As she got closer, she realized with horror that the dots were actually human corpses. After the natural disaster came the man-made disaster, the central Pakistani government's feeble response. Fully 90% of the area's inhabitants needed relief aid. A few days after the cyclone struck, Sidney Shanberg of the New York Times went down to an island in East Pakistan that had been raised by the storm. He heard stories of a baby torn from its mother's arms. But Shanberg was appalled by the Pakistani government's lassitude about delivering aid. Eric Griffel, the development officer who ran the large U.S. relief effort, says, The West Pakistani government didn't do anything, and other countries did a lot, led by our own. It was almost as if they just didn't care. Archer Blood remembered later, The international response, from the United States, the Soviet Union, Britain, and other countries, was much more visible than Pakistan's meager effort. American and Soviet helicopters were particularly conspicuous. There was huge resentment among Bengalis, notes Griffel, who saw foreigners doing more than their own government. Griffel says, the cyclone was the real reason for the final break. Blood and Griffel's teams worked day and night, fanning out across the stricken region. The Nixon administration gave substantial aid. U.S. government officials, privately frustrated at the Pakistani government, worried that U.S. emergency measures were getting swamped by complaints about stalled aid. One of Blood's officials in Dhaka noted that three months later, nothing whatsoever was being done for the victims. The Bengalis' alienation was all but complete. Even the Nixon administration secretly admitted that Pakistan's government had flubbed it. After getting roasted in the press, Yahya belatedly flew to East Pakistan to take personal command of the disaster relief. His brief appearance did not go well. Blood remembered disgustedly that Yahya had stopped in fleetingly on the way back from a China trip. There were still bodies floating in inland rivers, mass graves being dug with backhoes, everyone wearing masks because of the smell, throwing lime on it. Says Shanberg. And he was walking through with polished boots and a walking stick with a gold knob. These people didn't have any gold anything. We asked a couple questions, and he brushed us off with blah blah, then went home. Shanberg asked a Pakistani army captain why the military had not come sooner. The captain explained that if they had, India would have attacked. Shanberg was stunned. It just was totally paranoid. He says. At the White House, Kissinger warned Nixon that the deep antagonism of Bengalis for the central Pakistani government was now much worse. They worried that conspicuous U.S. emergency relief efforts could undermine Yahya's authority. 
The election, they knew, was just two weeks away. On December 7, millions of Pakistanis went to the polls, although some of the most devastated areas of East Pakistan had to delay their voting until January. The timing could not have been worse. Bengali politicians of all stripes slammed Yahya's government for ignoring their people in their hour of need. The voting gave Bengali nationalists a chance to shout their rejection of West Pakistan. The leader of the Bengalis was Sheikh Mujib Yur Rahman, who led a popular mainstream Bengali nationalist party called the Awami League. He was a middle-class Bengali Muslim, whose lifelong activism had cost him almost 10 years in Pakistani jails, making him a hero to many Bengalis. Mujib's very appearance suggested raw power. Cabled blood. A power drawn from the masses and from his own strong personality. He was tall and sturdy, with rugged features and intense eyes. Blood found him serene and confident amid the turmoil, but eager for power. On the rostrum he is a fiery orator who can mesmerize hundreds of thousands in a pouring rain. Blood wrote, Mujib has something of a messianic complex which has been reinforced by the heady experience of mass adulation. He talks of, my people, my land, my forests, my rivers, it seems clear that he views himself as the personification of Bengali aspirations. Mujib had distilled Bengali nationalist grievances into six points, calling for democracy, and also for autonomy for both wings of a federal country, with the central government restricted to running only foreign affairs and defense. East Pakistan would be able to engage in trade and aid talks, and even to raise its own militia. The Awami League campaigned hard on a six-point program. Mujib went to the cyclone areas to personally supervise the Awami League's own relief efforts, and returned to Dhaka to declare that the Pakistani government was guilty of murder. They have a huge army, but it is left to British Marines to bury our dead. When Blood met with Mujib, the Bengali nationalist leader predicted with preternatural confidence that he would sweep almost every seat in East Pakistan. That would not spell a Cold War defeat for the United States. The Awami League was well known as moderate and pro-American. Blood described the league as center-left, a temperate and middle-class party with no animus against the United States. Mujib liked to reminisce about his affection for Americans and his love of San Francisco. The 1970 balloting was a tremendous experiment in democracy. This was the first direct election in Pakistan's 23 years of independence, with all adults allowed to vote, including, for the first time, women. The people of Pakistan were to choose a constituent assembly, which would have the difficult job of drawing up a new constitution for the fragile country. Yahya might have tried to rig the voting, or used the cyclone as an excuse for an indefinite postponement of the elections, but he opted to allow this democratic moment. In West Pakistan, the rulers wondered whether Mujib really wanted autonomy, as he repeatedly said, or an independent state of Bangladesh, a debate that goes on to this day. Blood and the Dhaka consulate thought that the Bengalis could be satisfied with autonomy. The Indian government also believed this, Yahya and many West Pakistani leaders, however, suspected that Mujib's six points would prove to be merely the first six steps toward outright secession. Late in 1970, suspicious Pakistani intelligence agencies captured Mujib in a breathtakingly frank moment. They played the tape to Yahya, who was shocked to hear Mujib declare, My aim is to establish Bangladesh. He would tear Yahya's federalist framework for upcoming constitutional negotiations into pieces as soon as the elections are over. Who could challenge me once the elections are over? Yahya, reeling, growled to one of his top political aides. I shall fix Mujib if he betrays me. An almost equally audacious electoral campaign took place in West Pakistan. Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, a former foreign minister heading up the Pakistan People's Party, assembled a coalition for dramatic change, drawing on conservative rural leaders and urban radicals. Bhutto was handsome, sardonic, urbane, and rich, an unlikely background for such a volatile populist. He had earlier been thrown in jail by the military, but was now back out. Yahya may have hoped that a PP victory would allow him to stay in power, but Bhutto had his own fierce ambitions. He championed a leftist and tough vision of Pakistan, with a strong central government and a foreign policy that stood bitterly against India. Despite his Berkeley education, he was firmly anti-American. So Nixon loathed him. The son of a bitch is a total demagogue. Kissinger, more cautiously, described him as violently anti-Indian, pro-Chinese. Blood skewered him with a single word. Malevolent. 
Blood, who adored elections, was thrilled at the widespread excitement as Pakistanis got their first chance to choose their government. There were plenty of rallies and parades, with Mujib and other candidates in full cry, but relatively little violence. The major party leaders got to broadcast speeches on radio and television, in the choice of two out of three languages, English, Urdu, or Bengali. It was raucous and colorful. Butcher says, enjoying the memory. Blood was touched when a Bengali historian explained that the grinding experience of poverty had been relieved by the campaigning, powerful people asked for your vote, gave you respect, and promised to govern with your consent. You were no longer told that you did not know what was good for you. When the big day came, U.S. officials in Dhaka were pleasantly surprised, the voting was impressively legitimate, the best the country had ever seen. The soldiers and policemen at the polling stations were there only to keep the peace, and Blood saw no signs of voter intimidation. Everyone agreed that it had been free and fair. Women voted in droves. The elections were remarkably free. Says Butcher. It was fairly unique, turning a military government to civilian authority. It was an extraordinary thing. The Awami League won hugely. Out of 169 contested seats in East Pakistan, the League took all but two winning an outright majority in the National Assembly. Mujib stood to be Prime Minister of all of Pakistan. I was not surprised that Mujib Rahman won easily and tremendously in East Pakistan. Recalls Eric Griffel. There was tremendous Bengali pride in Mujib. Yahya's military dictatorship got trounced. His preferred candidates did miserably in both wings of the country. Humiliated, he was ruling over people who had rejected him east and west. Meanwhile the Pakistani military, some of them more hard-line than Yahya, recoiled at the prospect of Mujib running East Pakistan, demanding autonomy and resources, and perhaps making friends with India. Bhutto had ridden a populist wave to an impressive victory in West Pakistan, but because East Pakistan was more populous, Mujib won twice as many seats. The ambitious Bhutto thus found Mujib's triumph blocking his way. While Yahya and Bhutto were cutthroat rivals, a conservative, pro-American military man pitted against a leftist, anti-American firebrand, they were driven together in the panicky days after the election by a shared hostility toward India and a fear of losing East Pakistan. Blood, worried that Mujib would overplay his hand, coolly put off congratulating him for weeks. He would later fault an exultant Mujib for a blind faith in people power. When an Awami League leader asked if the United States would mediate if East Pakistan declared its independence, Blood flatly refused. He wanted nothing to do with secession, and hewed to the U.S. official line, One Pakistan. Galvanized by their triumph, Mujib and the Awami League had to make good on their campaign for autonomy for the Bengalis. Showing his popular strength, Mujib called a huge rally, where he pleaded with the rapturous crowd to carry on if he was assassinated. As Yahya, Mujib, and Bhutto began negotiating about the future of the country, Blood still hoped to avoid violence. He believed that Mujib was not aiming for secession except as a desperate last resort. My thinking was that the Awami League platform was a recipe for the dissolution of Pakistan. He said later, but it could be a recipe for the peaceful dissolution of Pakistan. This was a moment when the United States might have stood on principle. There had been a free and fair election, truly expressive of the will of the people. The democratic superpower could have encouraged Pakistan to deepen its democratic traditions. We are the great democracy, says Meg Blood. And here was a democratic game being played, as if they would pay any attention once Mujib had won. They were prepared to simply push him aside. She adds, we, the great American nation, leaned back and said nothing. The White House took almost no interest in upholding the results of Pakistan's grand experiment in democracy. Instead, the Nixon team dreaded the loss of its Cold War ally. The State Department unhappily thought that Pakistan was likely to crack apart. Kissinger asked Nixon whether the United States should be warming up to Mujib, who was friendly to the country. But Nixon, sticking with Yahya, scrawled, Not yet. And. Not any position which encourages secession. Harold Saunders, the White House senior aide for South Asia, braced Kissinger for the prospect of another partition. Expecting East Pakistan to secede, he asked Kissinger how hard the United States should work to avoid bloodshed. They were, he wrote, witnessing the possible birth of a new nation of over 70 million people. We could have something to do with how this comes about, peacefully or by bloody civil war.
A protracted series of negotiations between Yahya, Bhutto, and Mujib amounted to nothing. Mujib has let me down. Yahya bitterly told one of his ministers. I was wrong in trusting this person. On March 1, under pressure from Bhutto, Yahya indefinitely postponed the opening of the National Assembly, which had been scheduled for March 3. To the Bengalis who had decisively voted for the Awami League, this looked like outright electoral theft. Yahya, wiping away the democratic election that he had allowed, declared that Pakistan was facing its gravest political crisis. When Blood heard the news of the postponement on the radio, he dashed up to the roof of the Adamji Court building. We could see Bengalis pouring out of office buildings all around that neighborhood. He remembered. Angry as hornets. They were screaming in rage. They had believed Yahya, he thought, and now were being robbed of their democratic victory. Although the crowd stayed peaceful, many people were carrying clubs or lathis long wooden staffs, a weapon of choice for police in the subcontinent. He told the State Department, I've seen the beginning of the breakup of Pakistan. Scott Butcher, the young political officer, remembers a wave of civil disobedience, with outraged crowds in the streets and a number of clashes with the Pakistani authorities. The next day, Bengalis launched a general strike, in the storied tradition of mass mobilizations against the British Empire. This showed the generals who really ran East Pakistan. At Mujib's word, normal life came to a halt. The shops were shuttered, and neither cars nor bicycles were allowed on the streets, which instead were filled with Bengalis chatting and wandering around. Bands of youths roved the city, shouting, Joy Bangla! Victory to Bengal! Catastrophe loomed! Blood worried at incidents of arson and looting, and ugly acts of intimidation of West Pakistanis. There were some small but potentially disastrous skirmishes with the army, which was out in full force. Mujib called for disciplined and peaceful mobilization of his followers. I thought that the situation was intolerable to the army. Says Griffel. The solemnness of the population, the mild violence, the civil disobedience, the constant strikes, the university students, I don't think that was tolerable for long. Butcher was impressed by the military's restraint, which he found remarkable. They were being spat upon, harassed and hassled by locals, but behaving quite well under the circumstances. Yahya broadcast an angry speech to the nation on March 6, accusing the forces of disorder of engaging in looting, arson, and killing. Under pressure from these mass demonstrations, he announced that the new National Assembly would now open on March 25th. But with the politicians still deadlocked, Yahya threatened the worst. It is the duty of the Pakistan Armed Forces to ensure the integrity, solidarity, and security of Pakistan, and in this they have never failed. The result would be a bloodbath. The only possible hope was to avoid a military crackdown. Once the shooting started, the Bengalis would be radicalized, the military's prestige would be engaged, the violence could escalate into civil war. The whole region might plunge into chaos. In the last days before Yahya fired his fateful first shots, the United States did not exert itself to prevent that doom. There was plenty of warning. Kissinger was alerted that, according to Blood's consulate, there was almost no chance of Pakistan holding together. But Nixon put his trust in Yahya. I feel that anything that can be done to maintain Pakistan as a viable country is extremely important. He said, There are good people. Strong. People like Yahya are responsible leaders. Soon after, when Kissinger mentioned there was a problem coming with the separation of East Pakistan, the president was surprised. They want to be separated. Kissinger might breeze past advice from blood and the distrusted State Department, but it was much harder to ignore similar alarms from his own hand-picked White House staff. Samuel Hoskinson, who knew more about South Asia than anyone else in the White House, warned of a looming civil war that Yahya's government would probably lose. He recalled the recent horrors of the attempt by the Biafrans to secede from Nigeria. He suggested that Pakistan would be better off with a confederal system, giving East Pakistan under Mujib the maximum amount of autonomy short of secession. It was not the popular thing to say. Hoskinson remembers. We had some concern what kind of blowback we would get from Henry, which could be pretty bad. But he says. He didn't blow up on me. Not that time. Harold Saunders was quieter and impeccably polite, but on March 5 he warned Kissinger that the Pakistan army was probably preparing to launch a futile crackdown. There was still a last chance to avoid slaughter by leaning hard on Yahya. 
Saunders recommended a government report that argued for threatening to stop economic aid to Pakistan to prevent bloodshed. He emphasized the crucial decision. The tough question is whether to make a major effort to stop West Pakistani military intervention. The next day, Kissinger convened one of his frequent meetings in the White House Situation Room, gathering senior officials from the State Department, Pentagon, and CIA. It was the last high-level overview of U.S. policy before Yahya began his killing spree, a final opportunity for the United States to use its considerable influence to dissuade its ally from violence. A senior State Department official warned, the judgment of all of us is that with the number of troops available to Yahya a total of 20,000, with 12,000 combat troops and a hostile East Pakistan population of 75 million, the result would be a bloodbath with no hope of West Pakistan re-establishing control over East Pakistan. Another senior official warned of a possible real bloodbath, comparable to the Biafra situation. Kissinger seemed convinced at first. I agree that force won't work. He said, but when a State Department official argued that the United States should discourage Yahya from shooting, Kissinger dug in his heels. If I may be the devil's advocate. He asked, why should we say anything? He asked warily, what would we do to discourage the use of force? Tell Yahya we don't favor it. Kissinger said firmly, intervention would almost certainly be self-defeating. He invoked Nixon's friendship with Yahya. The president will be very reluctant to do anything that Yahya could interpret as a personal affront. He was skeptical of even the gentlest U.S. warnings. If we could go in mildly as a friend to say we think it's a bad idea, it wouldn't be so bad. But if the country is breaking up, they won't be likely to receive such a message calmly. He said. In the highly emotional atmosphere of West Pakistan under the circumstances, I wonder whether sending the American ambassador in to argue against moving doesn't buy us the worst of everything. Will our doing so make the slightest difference? I can't imagine that they give a damn what we think. The group, following Kissinger, settled on what a State Department official called massive inaction. Harold Saunders remembers that. There was a principle in their minds, which could be intellectually justified, although maybe not in practical terms, were not going to tell someone else how to run his country. This was, he adds, the same tenet used for the Shah of Iran. I think it was the wrong principle myself. He says, I heard it articulated by Henry on a number of occasions. Kissinger's decision stuck. He seemed more influenced by warnings that many West Pakistanis suspected that the United States was plotting to split up the country. The State Department instructed Blood not to try to dissuade Yahya from shooting. On March 13, Kissinger sent Nixon what would turn out to be his final word on Pakistan before the killing started. Kissinger made the case for inaction. He correctly warned that Yahya and the Pakistani military seemed determined to maintain a unified Pakistan by force if necessary. And he noted that a crackdown might not succeed. Mujib Rahman has embarked on a Gandhian-type non-violent non-cooperation campaign which makes it harder to justify repression, and, the West Pakistanis lack the military capacity to put down a full-scale revolt over a long period. But Kissinger urged the president to do nothing. He wrote that the US government's consensus, forged by him, was that, the best posture was to remain inactive and do nothing that Yahya might find objectionable. Kissinger did not want to caution Yahya against opening fire on his people, ruling out, weighing in now with Yahya in an effort to prevent the possible outbreak of a bloody civil war. It was undesirable to speak up because we could realistically have little influence on the situation and anything we might do could be resented by the West Pakistanis as unwarranted interference and jeopardize our future relations. Kissinger preferred to stick with Yahya. It is a more defensible position to operate as if the country remains united than to take any move that would appear to encourage separation. I know you share that view. There was one consideration that, while voiced by other U.S. officials, never made it into Kissinger's note to the president, simply avoiding the loss of life. The last chance of maintaining a united Pakistan would have been warning Yahya that force, especially brutal force, would be disastrous and have consequences for Pakistan's relationship with the United States. Just two weeks after the slaughter began, Kissinger would say that if the United States had had a choice on March 25, it would have urged Yahya not to use force. 
He was already covering up the fact that the Nixon administration had had many opportunities to make such requests to Yahya, and had expressly chosen silence. East Pakistan teetered on the verge of anarchy. With the days dwindling until the fateful March 25 deadline for opening the National Assembly, the three main Pakistani leaders kept on bargaining, but with frighteningly few signs of a political breakthrough. Bhutto insisted that his party, dominant in West Pakistan, should take a big role in any new government, and that Pakistan could not be allowed to disintegrate. Mujib, at another huge rally of half a million people, many of them carrying iron rods and bamboo sticks, held back from declaring an independent Bangladesh, but demanded that the army withdraw to its barracks and yield power to the winners of the election. It was a vast number of people who had suddenly become political. Says Meg Blood. They had been insulted because their vote had been ignored. The Pakistani security forces found themselves overwhelmed by an uprising that roiled throughout Dhaka, Chittagong, Jessa, and elsewhere. The Pakistani Martial Law Administration admitted that 172 people had been killed in the first week of March, figures they had to put out to debunk stories among livid Bengalis that hundreds or thousands had been killed. Archer Blood found the military's statement reasonable, almost apologetic in tone, and seemingly honest. Ominously, Pakistan flew in more and more troops, who landed from West Pakistan at the Dhaka airport. The airport became an armed fort, bristling with dug-in automatic anti-aircraft weapons and gun emplacements. Several times in March, Blood watched about a hundred young men debarking from a Pakistan International Airlines plane, all of them dressed alike in neat short-sleeved white shirts and chino trousers. They lined up and marched off smartly. Yahya shoved aside the moderate general who had been governor of East Pakistan, terrifying Bengalis with his replacement, Lieutenant General Tika Khan, known widely as the Butcher of Balakistan, for his devastating repression of an uprising in that West Pakistani province. Blood knew he was one of the most extreme hawks in the military, a killer. Blood still did not quite see the massacres coming. He was relieved that Mujib had chosen to avoid declaring independence, and predicted an essentially static waiting game as Bengali crowds faced off against the army. He would later be ashamed of his assessment. He knew that Bengali nationalists would not be cowed by a whiff of grape shot, and could not believe that Pakistan's generals would be stupid enough to try it. Blood was anything but an Awami League partisan. He saw Mujib as principled but exasperatingly obdurate, and warned the League that Yahya and his prideful senior officers had been restrained in the face of considerable provocation. Afterward, he would disgustedly condemn Mujib for overreaching. The nationalist leader had been swept away by the spectacle of tens of thousands of militant people, men, women and children of all classes thronged by the sheikh's house chanting slogans about the emancipation of Bangladesh. The name is Bengali for Bengal nation. The US consul was baffled by the mystic belief that essentially unarmed masses could triumph in test of wills with martial law government backed by professional army. Still, Blood admired the Bengali nationalist crowds. Swept up in their effusive mood, he confessed in a cable. A certain lack of objectivity. It is difficult to be completely objective in Dhaka in March 1971 when, out of discretion rather than valour, our cars and residences sport black flags and we echo smiling greetings of Joy Bangla as we move about the streets. He enthused. Daily we lend our ears to the outpouring of the Bengali dream, a touching admixture of bravado, wishful thinking, idealism, animal cunning, anger, and patriotic fervor. We hear on Radio Dhaka and see on Dhaka TV the impressive blossoming of Bengali nationalism and we watch the pitiful attempts of students and workers to play at soldiering. But his zest was tempered with growing dread. He came to realize how this would probably end. He hoped the army would follow logic rather than emotion. Blood, whose pragmatism outweighed his Bengali sympathies, even-handedly hoped for a political solution which will give something to Bhutto, something to Mujib, something to Yahya and the army, still preserve at least a vestige of the unity of Pakistan, and hopefully buy time for a cooling of passions. The best prospect would be a confederation, with Yahya as president of both wings, Bhutto as prime minister of West Pakistan, and Mujib as Prime Minister of Bangladesh, East Pakistan has become a term for geographers. Mujib could not compromise on his promises of autonomy, his people would never accept that now. But autonomy came dangerously close to independence for Bangladesh, and Blood thought that Yahya would likely balk. He presciently wrote, 
The ominous prospect of a military crackdown is much more than a possibility, but it would only delay, and ensure, the independence of Bangladesh. Blood suggested telling Yahya that the United States wanted a political solution, but the State Department, following Kissinger's guidance, maintained its silence. Dhaka became a more menacing place for Americans. The CIA warned Blood that communists were trying to assassinate him. Late one night, three Urdu-speaking men in a car without a license plate drove up to the Adamji Court building that housed the consulate, threw two handmade bombs, and fired a revolver into the air. The building shook. A few nights later, Archer and Meg Blood heard several gunshots at their house. Someone in a jeep had driven up to the consul's residence, fired three shots, and raced off. Meg Blood remembers suspicions fell on the Naxalites, the Maoist revolutionaries. They thought it would be a nice chaotic thing to assassinate the man in charge. The Bloods found bullet holes in the veranda off their bedroom. The U.S. consulate and other American buildings in Dhaka faced regular bombings with Molotov cocktails, which were nerve-jangling but so far mercifully amateurish. After two Molotov cocktails were thrown at American business offices in downtown Dhaka, Archer Blood shrugged it off. Bombing gangs still active and happily still ineffective. On March 15, which Blood bookishly noted was the Ides of March, Yahya arrived in Dhaka for more negotiations. It was, one of Yahya's ministers despairingly recalled, like giving oxygen to a dying patient when the doctors have declared him a lost case. Blood suffered a moment of optimism. Things are looking up. He reported after talks between Yahya and Mujib. The same day that he wrote that, there was a serious clash 20 miles north of Dhaka, as Pakistani troops opened fire when they were stopped by a furious crowd, killing at least two civilians. Mujib privately passed along a message to Blood that these provocations made it hard to sell a peace deal to his own people. Blood, having none of it, sent to Mujib. The natural rejoinders, rise above the matter, play the statesman, surely Yahya must be as unhappy about such incidents as Mujib. Despite pressure from more militant Bengalis, Mujib continued to insist to other East Pakistani politicians that he wanted to keep Pakistan's wings together, perhaps in some kind of confederation. Bhutto, adamant about Pakistan's unity, had been sitting out the negotiations. But on March 22, he came to Dhaka to join in the talks with Yahya and Mujib. Blood happened to be at the Intercontinental Hotel for a lunch, and caught a glimpse of the politician in the lobby. The hatred of the Bengalis for Bhutto was palpable, people hollered obscenities at the grim-faced man, who was flanked by bodyguards with AK-47 assault rifles. Blood later remembered Bhutto staring straight ahead, his reptilian eyes fixed on the wall. He was in the enemy's camp and he knew it. Another eyewitness saw eight truckloads of armed troops protecting Bhutto's car. At a press conference at the Intercontinental Hotel, Bhutto announced that Yahya and Mujib had reached a general agreement that made a promising basis for future negotiations. Blood was satisfied with the prospect of a deal that gave Mujib everything but independence and which, we believe, he could sell to people of Bangladesh. On March 24, Blood shrugged off a plea from Mujib, who wanted US pressure on Yahya to avoid a crackdown. Blood saw little evidence that Yahya was about to take a harder line. As Yahya, Bhutto, and Mujib negotiated frenetically, Blood's disastrously incorrect evaluation was agreeable to the higher-ups at the State Department, who preferred to avoid taking sides in Pakistan's politics. But Mujib suspected that the West Pakistanis were dragging out the talks to buy time to reinforce their military. The defense attaché at the Dhaka consulate, a U.S. Air Force colonel, visited two senior Pakistani officers. They were unbearably tense. One of them, a Pakistani wing commander, said that they would carry out their orders, but hoped they would not have to do the worst. It is a terrible thing to shoot your own people. 